is helpful. Um, this is, I guess you can do it on the first day of teaching a new book, or you can do it where you have one and on the first day of a new book, you do a new section in the workbook itself. Depends on what you want and what you think the students would be most comfortable with. And he, an example, um, if they learn house, mouse, train, or rain in class, then when you wrap up, you may ask them to draw a picture featuring either the house, the mouse, well, you saw my mouse, um, train, or rain. And if they can write, writing the words, or you give them the word and then they copy it into their workbook. So that's uh, really helpful. I like also workbooks because I think that you can use them with older learners, especially for words they don't like, because they're frequently not going to to want to learn them. So you can actually make a little challenge out of the words that I hate. And so you have the words that I hate challenge where they have to learn words that they really don't like and uh, make it fun. And so it kind of gets them psychologically over whatever that barrier is to that word. So that can be done in the workbook. Literature circles are another way. I think I've discussed this before. Um, but with young learners, oftentimes what you can do with literature circles is you can have them have pictures. So for very young learners where we're still doing the pictures, you know, they can, um, you can read the book to them and they can put the pictures in order. But what's different about it is that you actually give them little um, bookmarks. And the bookmarks might have faces on them that represent emotions. And so when they get to a part of the story that they're really excited about or they're really sad about, they can put the bookmark next to the picture to remind them of the feeling that they felt while you were reading it. And then they can talk about why this part made them sad or why that part made them happy. Um, what I would really encourage, if at all possible, people to do, I got this uh, from a book called Literature Circles is um, have older students come and read the books to the younger students. So this is really interesting because the older students feel really responsible because they're teachers now. And so they take the younger students and they make sure that they understand and they work really well with them in most cases. And the younger students, you know, they're like, wow, this older person is coming to talk to me. So they're really excited and they, they get really motivated about it. So you might have them, if this was a group, pretend that I was the older student and I was reading the, the book to them and they were having the pictures in front of them and their little bookmarks and they could put a placement of what they felt happy about. And then the older student would ask them questions about the story or might stop midway through the story and say, what do you think happens next? And then the students have to guess. And so with older students, what you would do is you would have copies of all the same book in a literature circle. And so they're all reading at the same time, and they're marking uh, notes on what they liked about the book, which character they liked the most, all different notes that you would take while you're reading. And then they have time to discuss it together. So it's not a teacher-centered activity. It's very much um, a learner-centered activity. And they, what's nice about it is I found that they enjoy reading more because they see it as a community event, not just something separate. And then they can talk about it and it engages, it engages them more with the stories. So it's nice for fostering lifelong learning and reading. Okay, yes, so focus on story, thoughts, and feelings about the book. Um, reading aloud. So basically, the key to this one, I know you're not supposed to have so much on the slide, but the key to this one is right here, where students generally love their teachers to read to them. And so reading out loud is really nice because you can mimic the correct stress and intonation patterns. And um, tapes and sound files. So again, I explained earlier how I did with Audacity, and I 
showed you like where you can get music that you can use legally, copyright free, to um, do the same sort of thing. But what I might do is I might have older students also make stories for younger students and read their stories in a form of a podcast. So that's another different sort of way to do the same activity, which would probably be reasonably um, encouraging. Okay, uh, this is again the American English website that I mentioned before. And the only reason I bring it up is because of the resource section, where you can download readings and stuff like that. Okay, so here's an example of one of the readings. You can get the Gift of the Magi and other stories. Um, they also have sometimes lesson plans, and uh, as you were saying, occasionally they'll have like pictures that you can, basically handouts that would go along with the story. Sometimes they're activities, um, etc. So then we also have kids.gov, which I've talked about before. This is just the main page. But there's a reading and writing section, which is what this is right here. And uh, there are a lot of different resources that you can go to. And then there are also reading games. So that's um, one way that you could encourage learners if you have access to computers in class or if you would like to assign it as homework. Um, Okay, so for absolute beginners, the books that I would recommend are um, I Like Books by Anthony Brown, or any of the ones that I put on the table, basically. Um, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See by Bill Martin Jr. And these have been successfully used in class, as I mentioned before. Um, the I forgot his first name, but we'll just call him Mr. Brown. Uh, uses these in his ESL classes. The Foot Book for Beginners by Dr. Seuss, and or any other Dr. Seuss book. I really feel like they go over very well with students. Inside of Art in the Country, or um, this one, The Shortcut. It's another good one for beginners. Um, Silly Sally by Audrey Wood and Don Wood. So those are beginning books. Next for intermediate, we're going on a bear hunt. Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, Itsy Bitsy Spider, and Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. I don't know if we have any Dr. Seuss books here. And, okay, so... Of course here is a plug for the ETRC, but we do have a lot of books um, to borrow. And the nice thing is, most of these books, I don't know if you've ever seen them before, but they give you all the different things that are practiced on the back. So for example, directional concepts, and it tells you which concepts are practiced. It talks about descriptive words, letter sounds, learning skills, small motor skills, and creative movement. So all of those are practiced in this book. So most of the books that we have do, if you look on the back, give you an idea of what you could use it for in class. Another um, website that I like is Children's Literature Web Guide. And what I like about it is they have a lot of discussion boards. So um, you can kind of like in and see what people are talking about, about different readings and students' perceptions. I also like the Children's Books Award, sorry, Children's Book Awards and Children's Best Sellers, um, because I like to know what's coming, and I like to read them to see if they would maybe be better than something I'm already using. And then also the teaching ideas for children's books. That's also very nice because it's a huge index of a lot of different ideas that we could use as teachers. And then there's more links down here, like stories that are on the web, authors that are on the web, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, for writing, now that we are transitioning, okay. Um, these are basic guided writing activities, just like in the beginning we talked about basic reading activities. And 
you see we have fill in the blank, we have dictation, um, we have letters, cards, invitations, interviews. There's actually a really interesting book, um, and I'm not sure this would be the, the level of your students, but you can um, adapt them, but it's called Surveys for Conversation. And so in terms of interviews, they have a lot. For example, there's one on my mother. And so they could take it home and try to interview their mother and then fill out the interview form in English. And um, I believe that they are copyable. Ew. Hmm. Never mind. This is designed to be a student workbook. So you would have to adapt it. Um, for your own learners, but it is a nice resource and it's very helpful. I'll just show you, like, here is the computer age. And so you'll see that there's a lot of text already written, and so it's a guided practice. And so they're just writing, they're just filling out more information. And it's a ton of different surveys, and some of them are very interesting. So it's worth looking into. Again, that's surveys for conversation. Um, controlled writing activities would be straight copying, matching, organizing and copying, delayed copying, copying a book, and or dictation. We also have the talking writing box. I do this a lot with um, young learners, and it's in some ways similar to the shoe box. But they each have their own box that they make, and they fill it with things that they love. And so what they, it can also be out of paper if you wanted to make the box out of paper. They might put photographs in it of their dog or their hamster or their family. Um, and then at different times during the lesson, I'll have them refer to their talking writing box. And then they could write whatever they can about their parent. Or they can talk about their parent. So it's sort of like a show and tell, but they always have it with them in the classroom. And so I try to put that as much into the lesson as possible so that there's some way to connect the lesson with their personal selves as a way of motivating them. Um, poems. So here are two series of poems that you will see are not for very young learners, but they are um, 10 and upwards. And they do need to be more of an intermediate level. I think that should be enough. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, oh, you guys all have one. That's great. So what I like about this is you provide a topic. It just needs to be a noun. And then if you turn to the back, you'll actually see some um, poems. And so... The first one is poems, poems, poems. And the next one is animals, animals, animals. And then they just put a bunch of adjectives in to describe whatever it is, whatever the noun is. And it's, it can be quite fun. You could have them do a Pecha Kucha with this, actually. We talked about that last week, right? And they could just have pictures and some of the words on their Pecha Kucha about, um, for those of you who weren't here, a Pecha Kucha is basically a PowerPoint presentation where you have 20 slides and they're only shown for 20 seconds each. And so that means that the total presentation takes 6 minutes and 40 seconds. And so this could become a Pecha Kucha so that it's a very fast presentation. Um, the other one that I'll pass out you hopefully that's enough is a bio poem these are quite fun as well okay. is there an extra one no okay so you can see on this one line one is your first name line everyone has one Line two, um, three or four adjectives that describe the person. Line three, important relationship, daughter of, mother of, etc. Um, line four, two or three things, people or ideas that the person loved. Line five, three feelings the person experienced. Um, line six, 
fears. Line seven, accomplishments. Line eight, two or three things the person wanted to see happen or wanted to experience. Line nine, his or her residence. And line ten, last name. As Can biography be changed into autobiography? Sure, why not? <laughs> You'd have to change a few things, but yeah, why not? Oh, I forgot. That was on that. So those are fun, like, 